<laughs> um, before I uh, before I read Michael's um, bio for those of you on the call and you most of you are regulars on here, um, Jim Cohn passed away last night, un completely unexpectedly, and so I just kind of wanted to do a quick uh, little moment of silence for Jim and. We'll just do like a 10, 10 second moment of silence, but he was a uh, definitely a giant in the survey profession between state association speaking and uh, engagements or speak at, you know, at teaching at Renton College, um, you name it. He was involved and definitely uh, a huge supporter of uh, Mentoring Mondays as well. And so I uh, just a quick little 10 second moment of silence for uh, Jim Cohn real quick. He will be missed, that was for sure. And it's worse when it's uh, completely unexpected like that, especially when no one, uh, no one plans on that happening to you. So um, with that, I will uh, introduce Michael's uh, bio really quick and then we'll kind of get started and we'll, uh, we can kind of open it up after. Uh, if you have questions along the way, you can just kind of use the raise your hand feature and uh, Mike's fine with uh, interrupting maybe at the end of one of the slides or whatever and ask your questions that kind of pertain to that particular subject or that time. So uh, Michael Knopf began his surveying and engineering experience in 1971 in Tulane County Public Works Department and engineering aid and draftsman involved in the county road and bridge projects. Leaving public employment in 1973, he joined Lane Engineers, a private consulting firm with the emphasis in land surveying, civil engineering and land development planning. During this engagement, he also worked under contract as a construction quality control representative on large earthwork and building projects for the U.S. Navy. During his time at Lane Engineers, he fell in love with surveying and worked in a supervisory capacity over the company land surveying activities and as a project manager for numerous land surveying projects. In leaving Lane Engineers in 1976, he helped form another firm that eventually became Michael Knopf and Associates in 1978, a civil engineering, land surveying, and land planning firm in Valencia, California. Licensed as a California land surveyor in 1977, he also became a licensed civil engineer in 1979. And in 1970, 1987, he obtained his general engineering and general building contractor's license. In 1998, Knopf's firm, Michael Knopf and Associates, merged with Quad Engineering and merged to become Quad, Quad Knopf, later named QK. La, Mike Knopf, Mr. Knopf served as a land surveying and engineering division manager until he became president and CEO of the firm in 2005, a position which he served for 12 years. As president and CEO, he oversaw the firm's overall operation, business development, client relationships. And in 2017, he stepped down from this role as his position as part of a planned leadership transition of the company and returned to the technical and supervisory role. Mr. Knopf is retired from full-time employment, but it still serves as the firm's outside chairman and continues to be involved as a special consultant for various projects and strategic initiatives. So, Mr. Knopf, we appreciate you joining and bringing all your experience tonight. And um, thank you. we, again, will kind of just... Uh, as you got questions, we'll just go uh, and roll with it. So thank you, sir. Thanks, Jocelyn, for helping out as well. All right, well, we'll dive right in. I, um, I sat in on Dr. Nettleton's uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago, and he covered, obviously, a lot of the material on this topic. So uh, deciding what I might uh, share, I thought it would make sense, other than the um, perspective that he brought of really a practice that specialized in expert witness. Uh, I would just bring the, the, the topic from the perspective of a typical surveyor in private practice, since um, I'm assuming many more of you would be likely to encounter the expert witness role uh, in that kind of a capacity. So starting with the definition of expert witness, this is from the federal rules of evidence. I, I like it because it's really useful for our purposes. Uh, individual courts obviously may have different uh, 
slight variations in their view of qualifying experts that that's going to go from judge to judge but i think this really covers the the uh, the role very well so a critical part of the definition is that really that first bullet point that you're you're there to assist the, the trier of fact to understand the evidence and determine an issue or fact in the case so it, it's a special professional role uh, you're there to assist the court um, you're not there necessarily to help one side or the other win the case. That's the lawyer's job, so not the, not the expert. Uh, the expert witness role is also unique because uh, you're permitted to offer opinion and a much broader a type of information uh, in your testimony than a typical witness would in terms of just observed facts and things that are much more restricted. Uh, the expert witness is also unique in that he has immunity because of the importance to the court of having experts uh, assist the court in dealing with uh, issues that are more technically uh, complex or issues that the court and the jur jury might be unfamiliar with. Uh, the, the role of the expert is essential for the court to function properly. And so that immunity is extended to make sure that uh, potential experts are not frightened away from the liability. Uh, remember, that half the parties in a trial lose. So for those odds, uh, chances of somebody being unhappy with you uh, are pretty high. So that immunity is important. It covers things like just being wrong. Um, your client loses the case. Uh, you do a lousy job of communicating. Um, you, you can't convince the, the jury that you know what you're talking about. You're completely covered uh, by immunity in those cases, but it doesn't cover uh, breach of contract or gross negligence in your duty to the client under your agreements with them. So, for example, uh, um, you may have specific conditions on reporting or, or timeliness or, or um, acting without prior approval, uh, things of that sort. So your contract uh, liabilities are still there even though your courtroom liability uh, is covered by immunity. Um, so typically when you, when you have a, a case come into your office, it's gonna come in as a, um, a phone call from an attorney. Uh, they may, may be just looking for information. Uh, they may be looking for an expert, um, but my experience has been that in many of these calls, they don't really ripen into an expert witness assignment. It's more a part of, uh, let's say, technical research or, or background information. Um, you may find that uh, you want to go forward with this. Uh, you may decide you want to just refer it to someone else. But often these things just, just end up after one phone call. Um, during this call, it's really critical to get all the information that you can about the case or the problem, the conflict. Uh, what's the location? What's the nature of the dispute? Uh, what are all the related issues? Uh, get all the history and details that you can. Um, you want to know who all the attorneys and the parties are, any other professionals that may have been involved with it. Um, it's especially important to get information about all the clients and the principals involved in the case. So some of these, these inquiries are pretty simple. They're easy to dispose of. Um, let's say you have a attorney that calls you and says, um, my client had a survey done and uh, found out that the neighbor's 100 year old barn is 20 feet over on this property and we're gonna sue him to make him move it. Uh, or a client uh, who buys a foothill property decides he's gonna close off a road that uh, has been there for a hundred years. You know, those kind of cases are pretty easy for you to really sort of school the attorney about things related to surveying and let them know that they're barking up the wrong tree or uh, to suggest some sort of an alternative approach, uh, mediation, lot line adjustments, uh, boundary line agreements and things of that sort are often a much better alternative. But, um, that you also may have a situation where you're, you're surveying property um, as sort of a conventional assignment, but you know that the neighbors are already kind of in, 
intention about where the line is and those kinds of projects while they may start as a typical boundary survey are more likely to ripen into a, an expert witness assignment for you later on. Um, you may just decide on that call that you you think that it's just kind of a distasteful conflict you don't want to get involved in. Um, but assuming that from this information, um, it looks like something where you can help, uh, the next step is to check for conflicts of interest. Uh, chances are, uh, if, you're, if you're part of a company that's been around for a little while, it's very likely that you, you may have relationships, you or someone else in the company, with some of the parties involved in the lawsuit, either the attorneys or the, or the principals. Even if that's not the case, um, unless you're the owner of the company, uh, there can be uh, kind of conflicts with your employer's interests that management will need to weigh in on. Um, things that we've encountered, you may have a, a client who's part of a, a business or industry group that's very close knit with maybe a small number of, of key players and they view litigation against one as litigation against them all. It could uh, hurt business prospects. It could be um, dealing with a particularly controversial uh, principal or, or law firm. So there are things like that that you want to make sure that your management has bought in on. Um, could also have a client or, a, or an attorney that just generally has a poor reputation and this is somebody that you want to really hook up with on a project like this. So assuming that you, you clear the conflicts, the next step, you're going to want to go through and really do a pretty in-depth level of uh, due diligence. Um, I start out uh, basically letting them know that it's an interim decision to look into it because I think I might be able to help. I do that before I've made any commitments. Um, I ask to see everything that's available. Uh, I want to be able to have them bring all their files in and allow me to see them uh, unconstrained. So uh, letters, emails, reports, uh, maps, documents, uh, photos, anything that they have, I ask them if I can see it um, and generally insist that that's what I want to I want to do. The main thing I'm looking for there is I want to make sure that that um, I'm not going to have something uh, surprise me later. But um, just to comment on my my motivation for these things, they they can be very burdensome in terms of demands on your time. Um, it, 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 you're often called to um, you know, meetings or depositions that are, that are very inconvenient. Um, you're, you're dealing with a lot of moving parts. And so for me, the reason that I, that I take those assignments is I feel like it's somewhat of a professional duty, especially if it's a boundary uh, uh, type case or in my case, an engineering case where I think that the parties are acting in good faith. Um, I'm likely to be useful if I think I can be helpful uh, to uh, getting a good in, uh, uh, outcome with my, my experience and insights. Um, and if I can advance the public interest or the or, or just outcome by, by participating. I'm not trying to, to uh, you know, pick a winner or whatever, but if I think I can help uh, a lot of these things really as I mentioned earlier, the courts depend upon people like us to get involved and help work through issues that are very complex and which the parties may have really not a, a very good understanding about. So um, it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that, that there's no hiding the ball. If I sense that people are holding back or not being very forthcoming on information, um, they're probably trying to manipulate you into a, a certain conclusion by concealing material information that they may have. In a case like that, um, you know, run in the other direction. I, I will always decline if I don't feel like I have uh, the complete uh, trust and access uh, to the information that I need to make a good decision. Uh, you really can't afford as a professional to have your credibility tanked either in a deposition or a trial because some information that was concealed from you uh, is brought out by the other side and it would have altered your opinion or at least created a higher level of doubt that you were not able to address. So as my old mentor used to tell me, uh, your credibility is not a renewable resource. 
So invest it wisely. You don't want to become one of these, uh, a hired gun. Uh, in my travels, uh, not only working on cases as a consultant, but in the firms that where I was a CEO, I always managed uh, any, any kind of uh, claims or litigation uh, and was often involved on behalf of our clients, uh, just as a counselor uh, on a technical level and those kinds of things. And so I often heard the term hired gun uh, as a reference to uh, expert witnesses on the other side. Uh, it was not intended to be a compliment. Um, there was just a, a lot of disdain because um, some of these experts had attained the reputation of being essentially, uh, you know, willing to uh, attest to almost anything for the for the fee that they were being paid for the client that was paying them. Um, you know, that said, and I know none of us would would intentionally. Um, embrace that kind of a role, that we have to recognize that it, it's natural to want the person that we, that we like, that we're working with, um, to be successful in their case. Uh, it's also natural for the attorney to want your testimony to be beneficial to their case or for unfavorable observations or conclusions uh, to be avoided. You know, those are just natural human reactions, but, um, we can't succumb to that temptation. We have to be aware of it and make sure that we don't find ourselves uh, at least leaning towards something that we don't want to become. So as an expert witness, it, it's like a lot of professional uh, assignments. It, it has overlapping duties and responsibilities. I think that um, the highest uh, duty is the one that we owe to the court to be truthful, honest, and neutral. Uh, technically, the, the expert never wins or loses a case. Uh, your client wins and loses. Uh, your client's attorney wins and loses. But you're there to testify, uh, essentially, um, on behalf of the court to help them understand the issues that are at stake and hopefully to make good decisions. Um, you should never have a stake in the outcome, you know, as a, as a, a contingent fee or promise of other work or things of that sort, because it's hard enough to manage those conflicts as it is. You don't want to make them any more complicated. Um, we do this on a, on a regular basis. When we survey property, we may have our, our best client um, that we're doing work for. Um, we don't let the fact that, um, that it's our best client influence where we think the line should go. We always make those decisions based upon our best judgment about the outcome that is uh, most correct. So it's the same kind of principle. Um, another duty that we have that is probably more critical in this kind of assignment is the duty to preserve strict confidentiality. Um, loose lips sink ships. Um, you're likely going to be reviewing privileged information that's highly confidential, the disclosure of which could cause great harm to your client and the law firm that represents them. Um, you will know things, uh, even just the fact that you're being consulted in the first place is uh, something that, at least in the early stages, has to be kept strictly confidential. You've been trusted with a great responsibility if you decide to take on this kind of an assignment, and you want to take great pains not to violate that trust. I mentioned earlier duties stipulated in the contract. These are things that can get you in trouble. Um, a lot of times the, the contracts are very um, general and they don't have these kinds of specific performance provisions, but if they do contain things like when you're allowed to put things in writing, um, what kind of notification is owed and the timeliness of that, if you discover something that could have an impact on your, on your opinion, um, failing to communicate in ways that are specifically defined in the agreement, um, timeliness or mode, those kinds of things, if you violate those provisions, obviously you're, um, you violated your duty to the, con to the, to the, to the person on the other side of the contract, your client. Um, the final one is your, your duty for professional practice in the sense that while the nature of the assignment is somewhat unique, 
the level of your professional practice that you bring to the to the table uh, is not. Um, it, it must be based on the same kind of professional standards of care that were owed on, on any kind of professional assignment. The operative word here, since we are professionals, is professional. So going back to the definition of the expert witness, B, C, and D really cover it pretty well. It has to be based on sufficient facts and data, things that you've researched, uh, that you've been thorough in searching out for yourself. Um, it has to be a product of reliable uh, professional principles and, and practices. And those principles and practices have to be properly applied to the situation that you're in. Um, I've got uh, an experience I'll, I'll relate at the end where that was, was really almost a humorous uh, um, occurrence where those kinds of things were sort of, sort of thrown out by uh, uh, a whole group of other experts. When it comes to fees and charges, I get asked about that a lot. Um, my approach is to um, treat this like any other assignment at the beginning. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't always know whether it's gonna turn out just to be a, a research call from the attorney or possibly an assignment that's a more typical surveying assignment or just background for them. It's the kind of thing that we would do with almost any project in, in a way. So for me, I use my, my regular rates until a decision has been made that either it, it either will be or likely will be used as an expert witness. Because when that happens, you, you begin to uh, adopt certain uh, behaviors. And in that regard, um, you know, we're willing then to, to notify the client that the, the, the fee is going to be different. Um, so for me, that's just how I approach it. Um, not everyone has to do it that way, but um, that's how I approach it. And part of the problem with, the, with the, the expert role at that point is that you're really on their clock and their schedule. Um, I know um, Dr. Dennison mentioned you know, requiring certain notice and all of those kinds of things. And, and, and those are good to do, but I found that with the uh, difficulty in getting clients and attorneys calendar scheduled, um, it, it seems to me that uh, my approach has always been to be as flexible as I can and recognize there's a lot more people involved here that are trying to schedule dates and days. And so for that, I think it's time to, to make the decision to go to the higher rate. Um, once the case is, is obviously uh, going towards an expert witness assignment, it's time to really focus on certain, certain behaviors. Um, language that you use, for example, you're, you're always going to be asked about any opinions that you form. Um, so it's best to avoid uh, using those terms in communications uh, too early in the process before you've been uh, able to completely uh, conclude uh, all of the work that has to go into that. Um, it's important that you not make uh, statements that uh, you have to back up uh, later or walk back because you were uh, acting maybe in haste or without um, completing all of your research and background information. Um, one thing that's really important, no guessing, uh, no assumptions. You know, we do that a lot in our work, obviously. And, you know, we get hunches, we get, uh, we, we, we come across things we're pretty certain about, but in a case like this, you don't make statements like that without being certain. That means you, if you're, if you're pretty sure that something is true, uh, you don't say that until you've completed all of your research and verified it for yourself. Um, I had a I had a case I worked on where the city attorney said, "I need you to be the witness." And uh, it was a project that we had done for the for a city, and they were having some construction issues. And uh, there were two other engineers that were more knowledgeable about the project than me. And I said, "What's wrong with those guys?" And he said, "Well, one of them has got a good handle on the project, but you know." Twice I caught him guessing or assuming and stating it as a fact, and I found out he was he had verified those things. He was wrong. Uh, he does that on a, in a deposition or on the stand, and 
um, his credibility of all of his testimony along with our case was right out the window. Um, the other one, uh, the other fellow was uh, knowledgeable about the details, and had his facts right, but he said that the attorney told me that the jury will never believe him. He's, he's you know, furtive and he looks nervous and he won't make eye contact. And he keeps looking around like he's looking for the exit. And I don't think I can coach him to be believable. So I ended up being, being called in and had to research all the facts myself to, to really to prepare for that just because of the, the need to have someone credible that couldn't be um, basically destroyed by, by guessing. So it's really important that we be careful when we're making statements to our client and the attorney, much less in the depositions and in the trial if it goes that far. Um, the next thing that's going to happen, you're going to be asked for your CV. Um, it's more detailed than a typical resume because it, it includes um, information about um, you know who you are as a person. Uh, Stand CV is curriculum uh, by tie, V tie, or by key. It's uh, that's probably why they abbreviate it, but it just means basically the course of your life. Uh, it has more information than a typical resume about your work history. It's generally a little longer, but but the other side wants to know about you. So personal details, were you an Eagle Scout, Chamber of Commerce president, um, awards and scholarships, civic activities, committee work, things like that are generally included. Because the, the other side, uh, as well as your counsel, wants to know uh, as much as they can about you. You need to know it cold. Um, they will usually, in a deposition, start with the CV, and it isn't unusual for them to ask you a lot of questions about it. Um, I was in one deposition where um, they probably spent at least two hours on the CV. It was, it was really maddening, but I think they were just trying to see if, if, if they could rattle the witness, but uh, they would ask questions, follow-up questions. It, it just went on and on, literally for a couple of hours. So you have to know it cold, memorize it, uh, have it with you, if you don't remember a detail and you're just a, you have a kind of a, a brain cramp or something, uh, know where to go to, to get the information. So you're projecting confidence and competence about your qualifications. Um, in the depositions, you'll, you'll be getting coaching from the attorney. They'll tell you short answers, yes or no, impossible. But, um, and, and I think that's generally good advice, um, but you need to be able to answer the question that they really are intending to ask. You can't play games and then have to cause a, a situation that's confusing in the in the um, uh, in the transcript that have have to be explained later. So make sure that if the, if the question is um, uh, is poorly framed, it's okay to say, you know, is this what you're asking, or or can you rephrase that? I'm not quite clear. Um, you're, you're on occasion going to have opportunity to say, you know, let me explain, because this is, this is a little bit complicated. Um, your client's attorney may get a little nervous, but again, if you're careful, um, you're, you're trying to answer the question, you're trying to get a, a transcript record that's accurate and not uh, confusing uh, so that you have to try to unwind that in the trial later on. So. Uh, to the extent that you can participate uh, somewhat in that. Uh, I've never been called out on it, and I've, I've been in many, many depositions. So, uh, if opportunity knocks to really get the information out more clearly, uh, a longer answer is okay. Uh, and I've been thanked for those, even though I, I think I probably made the attorney alert at the beginning. Um, you will generally hear a lot of objections to the uh, to the attorney's um, questions from the other side. Uh, your attorney will object and say um, what their objection is and then immediately tell you to go ahead and answer the question. Just expect that. It, 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 can, it can interrupt your train of thought, but they're preserving their ability to object to that line of questioning at trial if necessary. Um, 
once in a while they'll instruct you not to answer the question um, if if it's because of something you think they misunderstand um, you can ask for a break and discuss it with them in the corridor in private um, but generally speaking um, if they tell you don't answer don't answer um, they, that's unusual they will usually tell you to go ahead and answer the question but if you're if you know that's coming and and it, it becomes part of the routine it's it's not going to throw you or make it make you lose your place. Um, you may be videotaped. Um, I was at a deposition one time, it went two days, it was a videotape the whole time. You have to remember that there's a reason they're doing that. Uh, posture, um, your presentation, uh, hand movements, things like that. You, you want to be aware the camera's there but completely disregard it otherwise. So just in case that happens to you, um, you should be prepared for that. It's rare, but it does happen. Um, you do want to review your transcript promptly, thoroughly, carefully. You'll be given a copy of the transcript. It takes some time to go through it, um, but you may find that you answered a different question than the one they asked. Uh, if you were sort of following a train of thought, sometimes the question is not exactly the one you thought. Uh, or you'll realize that um, while you answered correctly, the answer is confusing and needs explanation. So uh, go through that carefully and anything that you think needs to either be corrected or clarified, uh, work with your client's attorney uh, quickly and get that resolved. They will use those situations uh, in the courtroom to, to discredit your testimony if your testimony is different uh, because you made an error in the deposition. You don't want that to happen. Or as I mentioned earlier, if it's confusing and you want to try to unwind that beforehand, not, not in, the, in a courtroom. Uh, the depositions seem to have a, a, a huge impact on the future course of, of the case. Most of the time, uh, it's after they've done their discovery and the depositions that um, cases settle, and they settle more often than they go to trial. But um, they often encourage for the settlement because the other side now knows what your testimony is. They've had a chance to size you up and decide if you're going to be credible to the jury, um, if you're going to be someone they can rattle and, and discredit that way. Once they've figured out what it is, you know, they have all the information they need to make a wise decision about settlement. So does your side. So that's often what happens after the, after the deposition. Um, one thing that's, that's really important, this is a practice that I, that I always follow. Um, don't put it in writing uh, until an appropriate time. Um, you'll be asked to bring all your written notes, reports, uh, correspondence, emails, everything. Uh, to the deposition, it's all discoverable. It's all going to be potentially exhibits in a trial. So um, remember, you don't know everything until you know everything. So uh, it's important not to uh, engage in kind of ready fire aim. You want to make sure that the timing is right. You want to make sure that if you if you are finding things that work strongly against what your client was thinking or expecting from you, uh, talk to them about it, use the phone a lot, uh, have personal meetings, because you know if you say something that's harmful in a document that can be discovered because it turns up later, uh, it's harmful to your client. Um, you don't have any choice in the matter, but to testify to that if you're asked about it. So if you find things that you discover that are harmful to the client, even though your opinions on the matters that they brought to you originally are helpful, uh, they may choose not to use you because they don't want to put you in a situation where that information that you discovered can be discovered by the other side. Uh, the attorney's job is different than our job. The attorney is an advocate for their client. They're not obligated to put into the into into evidence information that's harmful to their case, um, so I wait until um, the 
instructed to do that after, after again, uh, verbal um, consultation with them. I don't know where I got that. It was probably years ago. Someone may have asked me to do it that way, but I've adopted that as a policy. And almost every time when I lay that out in terms of what's expected, um, the attorney simply says, thank you. So it's obviously important to do it that way. So be careful with things you put in writing. Whatever you write down is going to be have to be produced. Um, so when you get to the trial, what to expect? Um, it's usually much shorter than the deposition. Uh, the deposition, uh, the meetings that you have with uh, with your client, uh, with your client's attorney, they're much more exhausted, much lengthier. They're trying to discover information, why they call it discovery. So they're gonna be talking about a lot of things that will never go into the, the trial with itself. Um, if your testimony is gonna be helpful to your client's case, they're gonna put you on to discuss that. If it's helpful, then the other side may simply not wanna draw any more attention to it, make it any more memorable. Uh, they may not have any questions and just hope it sort of goes away unnoticed. Uh, sometimes they'll come on and, and cross-examine. Once in a while, they'll really tear into you. That's kind of unusual. Um, judges and juries don't like to have expert witnesses abused by lawyers, so it's 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 generally avoided. Um, but you know, take your time. Make sure you you heard the question correctly. Uh, just as in the deposition, if you're not sure if it's confusing, uh, ask them to clarify it. Um, compound questions are very common. Um, you have to be careful to clarify which compound, which part of the compound question you're answering, because it could be yes and no on the same question. So there, I don't know that they do that on purpose. I think a lot of times attorneys are not always um, uh, comfortable enough with the material that we're that we're dealing with that they can always make their questions nice and crisp. So be careful with that. Um, it's been mentioned before uh, that um, it's a good idea to remember you're there to aid the jury and the court. So whether it's a, a trial before a judge or with a jury, um, that's really the people you're presenting this information to. So it's a good idea to look at them. But that doesn't really apply when uh, the counsel's asking you, you know, matter of fact questions. Uh, it would be weird you know, if someone asked you, did you see this document to turn to the judge or the jury and say yes? You know, that's not really how it works. Um, you're having uh, direct answers to matter of fact questions, but um, when uh, you're asked, can you explain to the court um, what you, the steps you went through before you uh, formed an opinion, or can you explain to the court what you learned or something like that? Then yes, you want to turn to the people that you're there to assist um, with this information, with your answers. And uh, so that's just a, something that I would mention just to make it a more comfortable and natural feeling process for you. Um, there, is, um, there is a scheduling problem. So if you're uh, likely to be called to testify in a trial if it goes that far, Make sure you review your calendar and let your client's attorney know when you have really hard um, uh, dates and times that aren't available because these things move around a lot, especially with COVID. Courts are overloaded, uh, they're short on resources and uh, that makes scheduling challenging enough as it is. But with COVID, it's, it's a mess. Um, so they're frequently overloaded processes take longer, run into the next day or the next week. So um, you have to be flexible and you have to let uh, your clients, lawyers know when they're actually not available. Uh, that means you have to be prepared with co proper courtroom attire, maybe for over several days because you're not sure when they're gonna call you. Um, I was once called to testify over the phone. Um, it was kind of a, they had a time slot so I couldn't get up to where the trial was being held, it was a two hour drive. And so um, I was put on speakerphone in the courtroom and sworn in and 
question, cross examine. It was strange talking to the telephone, but um, you never know what's going to happen. So I mentioned that just in case it's something that happens to you, you'll be prepared for it. So um, a, a few observations and I'll, I'll wind up. Um, you know, you never really know what's going to happen if it goes to a trial. One of the early boundary cases I worked on, um, the, it was an urban, uh, kind of a large estate lot situation, uh, kind of overgrown trees and, and uh, hedges and that sort of thing. The client was, I was told, was a war planner. And so what he was doing was planning a war against his neighbor. Uh, I learned more about that later, but we, we surveyed a property line that he wanted surveyed and the neighbor had had another survey done that had a, a, a different position. These two lines were four to six inches apart. Huge uh, uproar over really nothing. And um, the interesting thing about it is the, the judge determined to order the property line to be in the middle of the two survey lines. So he picked the one location that everybody would agree wasn't right. And uh, I took that lesson with me throughout the rest of my career. Uh, you never know what's going to happen if you get into court. It's not a good place to be. So if, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the initial context, I try real hard to uh, look for other alternatives that might be a lot less expensive and uh, help your client to avoid uh, destroying his, his peace and enjoyment of his home by having uh, this ongoing war with a neighbor over something that really isn't that important to be settled much more easily through alternative methods. So, uh, but that was a tough lesson. You may get into assignments that are only indirectly um, related to surveying. Uh, examples, and, and by the way, there'd be no difficulty getting you uh, qualified to testify on those matters because they're part of your practice, even though they may not typically be considered you know, surveying in the purest sense. Um, questions or, or testimony about um, it, the entitlement process or conditions of approval or time limits or how to satisfy uh, conditions on a, on a project. Um, what sort of improvements are likely to be attached to a project like this that you may be managing for a client as a surveyor. Uh, you may be asked to comment on uh, the um, quality of plans from the perspective of how easy or complete they are for a surveyor to be able to stake from them. Those are things we deal with all the time and the uh, court would have no problem in most cases uh, allowing that testimony as part of your experience uh, and your expertise. So those kind of things happen. One that I, I got involved with that was kind of interesting was a, uh, on a, a large uh, uh, commercial swimming pool or um, it was a, a school and put the pool in, but in a meet um, there was a false start and one of the competitors just sort of did a, sh a short dive instead of a long flat dive. Uh, I don't know whether he lost his balance or whatever, but uh, fractured his, his uh, cervical spine and it became a quadriplegic. So uh, we were hired to do a very tight grid on the bottom of the pool uh, in the winter while it had water in it uh, to, to try to assess what the, what the um, standard deviation was on the depth of the pool, whether it met appropriate specifications and things like that. So you never know what you're going to get into. Um, that case didn't involve me uh, uh, testifying in a trial, uh, but I'm sure it was it was settled um, because of the injury involved. But anyway, you never know what you're going to get. And uh, at this point, there's still a little time for questions. So that's all I have for you. And unless, uh, unless there's any other questions I can answer. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I saw in the chat, uh, Danny had a question about um, being licensed in the state. Where did it go? In order to be an expert witness, do you have to be licensed in the state in which the case is in? So if he's licensed in Colorado, can he be an expert witness in the state of Utah? 
Um, I don't believe you do, but um, I would say this, since you know we've had offices in different states in the past, um, I have learned through that experience that the, the standard custom and practice can vary substantially from one place to another. Right. So um, if the nature of the testimony that you're being asked about is something that is uh, universally uh, appropriate in different jurisdictions, for example, public land system or you know um, um, restoration of lost corners or you know things that don't really uh, change too much from one jurisdiction to another, you could probably with with research um, be qualified to testify for those things. If it was something that was much more subject to um, the kind of variations that we see, staking techniques, uh, uh, standards of accuracy, um, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, what 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 is expected uh, for, from a surveyor for mass grading that fulfills at 25, 25 feet, for example, right. as opposed to, you know, six tenths of a foot. Those are the kind of things that um, I would probably refer to someone local because uh, questions about custom standards of practice, um, standard of care, those are things that require local knowledge. Uh, if it's something that doesn't, if you're not specifically or strictly required to be licensed in that state to be qualified as an expert, as long as the subject matter is something that you could qualify for. Yeah. You don't even have to be licensed, obviously, to, to qualify or be considered qualified by the court to testify about certain subject matter. If it were a purely a surveying issue, yes, obviously, you would need a land surveyor's license to be able to comment on things relating to that. But a lot of ancillary issues that you might otherwise be qualified to, to testify about wouldn't, strictly speaking, require a license. Got it. Perfect. And then he had a follow up to that. Was anybody willing to uh, provide some sample contracts, example contracts for the, what they're using for expert witnessing? So, so do, if anybody wants to share that kind of stuff, you can email it to me and then I can put it in the Dropbox folder. So, um, any specific questions? Anybody want to talk about their tips or tricks that they've done on an expert witness case? I'm sure there's some pretty good experience on this call that have probably been through a few cases. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Another message, what have we got? Has anyone been burned in an expert witness case? <laughs> it's a good one, Danny. <laughs> Not that anybody wants to talk about it, apparently. Well, I would, I would say this, it, it is not, uh, um, it, it's not entirely unusual to be, um, to start out on a case that doesn't go the way that was expected by the client's attorney. And um, when they change direction, they want you to change direction too. That can be awkward because you're already engaged, you already have a client relationship. They, they may have paid you a lot of money to look at an awful lot of data. And when the answer isn't what they were looking for, you know, they have to cast about in order to rec really represent the client for another strategy. And those other strategies aren't always strategies that you can help them with. So that can be awkward. I wouldn't say being burned, but I would say it can be difficult to unwind out of that client relationship at that time. Sure. Uh, the fact that I, an example of I, I had to uh, testify once for the Department of Regulation and Licensing in Wisconsin for a license review. And one of the things that I can um, I want to emphasize is communicate with your attorney because uh, a lot of the times the other side will limit you to yes or no question, yes or no answers. 
although a lot of the times with legal principles, you can't answer them cleanly, yes or no. And I remember in one particular case, um, I was asked about, is a call for an adjoiner always a call for a senior owner? And I said, no, but, and I was told you can only, you only answer yes or no. And I wasn't given a chance to clarify uh, under what conditions a call for an adjoiner could in fact be a call for a junior owner because there are situations for that. And my attorney had, I had just gotten a brand new attorney because the other attorney had bailed uh, before that. So I hadn't communicated with this attorney too much. So instead of realizing that I was trying to explain it on follow-up, what she should have done is say, could you explain what you were getting at when you said no but? Uh, she, and she didn't offer me the opportunity to explain that. So be sure that you communicate with your attorney so that they know that if you have a concern about something like that, then on follow-up or on redirect, they can ask you to clarify that point. Otherwise, it'll never get covered. Uh, good stuff. That's great information, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I had a well, comment, if you can hear me. Yeah, go for it, Frank. One of the things that uh, an attorney talked to me about a long time ago, and I really appreciate it, is that when you give a deposition, obviously you're answering the, the straightforward questions that they're asking you. And typically at the end, they're going to ask you, are those all your conclusions? And, and the one thing that the attorney taught me that I really appreciated was to basically come back with, based on the information I have at this point in time. And if other data, other information comes along between now and the date of the court, my opinion may change. And that it gives you an out and it shows that you're not, you know, going down a road, uh, you know, with blinders on, you're open to information. And that's really important to convey that to the judge and to the attorney on the other side. Yeah, yeah very good, Frank. Yeah, that's the, that's the kind of stuff I was looking for too from you know, some of you guys where you've been through these cases for people that who may watch this video later can definitely pick up on a lot of, on all of that kind of information. So very good points, Jerry and Frank. Uh, Will Rings, Wing says, make sure your payment arrangements are in writing. I found it hard to collect after the case is closed. Yeah. Um, here in Nevada, we have a written contract law, so can't even uh, get into uh, start work until you have a written contract in place. So Thankfully, we have that law in uh, in, in place here in Nevada. It's uh, always hard to determine how many hours you're going to spend in a case, for sure. I know that one for sure. <clears throat> it's supposed to be, you know, you just kind of, when you're doing your expert witness casing like that, it definitely, you just want to do a T&M rate and you want to provide them a, uh, a rate sheet for, you know, court document review and then report preparation and depositions and court cases and stuff like that. And so it's all just has to be kind of T and M. I think it's probably the best way to get around that. Never do a uh, expert witness case as a lump sum. That's for sure. <laughs> One thing I, I think Dr. Nevelson mentioned this too, as well that I will typically do is that um, they'll authorize a certain amount because you know, they, I mean, you can't really say, the sky's the limit and have them engage you at that point with no information. So they want to have some control over what they're spending. So they'll get some amount, say $5,000 or sure. you know, $10,000, depends on the nature of the, of the case. But then you, you're billing time and material up to that amount. Just don't go beyond it. Yeah, t and Nectar. Until so they authorize that. Sure, yep, got it. Anybody else want to kind of add in? Schroeder, you've done no expert witnessing. You got no experiences to chime in on? I, I've done a lot of uh, work through deposition, but I've never actually gone to trial for okay. my expert testimony. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> How much does one charge for TM for an expert witness? That's uh, from Danny. And like ours, uh, ours is typically different. It's structured, Danny, and I'm sure maybe everybody's is kind of the same, but I can share you my stuff as well, Danny. Frank, you, uh, you muted yourself, Frank. There you go. One of the things that I wanted to, to mention, 
was that just because you're licensed doesn't mean you're an expert. And I've been in trial quite a few times and I've seen uh, other surveyors get up in the stand and be very cocky about the fact that they're an LS, but they have to qualify and the judge is the one that qualifies them. And uh, I, I've seen some get up there pontificate about their background and such and the, and the judge dis, dismiss, them, dismiss them as not being an expert. And by the same mm -hmm. token, I've seen people that have had years in the business that are not licensed uh, be qualified as an expert. And so that's just something I wanted to put out there because I see a lot of comments on different surveyor sites and somebody says, well, now that I'm licensed, I'm a professional, I'm an expert. And it's like, there's more to it than that. And, and you just really have to be careful about that. And it can be pretty uh, humbling to get in front of a judge and get shot down as an expert. Just wanted to pass that on. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Frank. I, I had a situation once where I was brought into a case as an expert witness and it was kind of an ambush for the other side. And so their attorney uh, got up and protested or, or uh, disputed the fact that I should be allowed as an expert witness. Unfortunately for him, the judge in the case had been a guest speaker at, at our NALS chapter meetings for about five of the last six months and we were very good friends and while the attorneys argued back and forth uh he paid very little attention to that and i ended up getting allowed as an expert witness and, you know it wasn't a big deal really but uh it, it was just a thing where he knew me and he knew i was involved in the profession and he was willing to allow me to answer some questions nice that's cool Good stuff. Anybody else want to chime in or have more questions? Nobody? <laughs> well, I guess that's it, Mike. You get an early night. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jocelyn. Yeah, thank you for putting this on. Of course. Thanks, Mike. Good information. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.